comparison center. That's not how it works in real life. See, we don't have so much, most people don't have so much time to investigate. Most people don't have so much time to actually get a hold of a copy of the Gerson uh, 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 therapeutic manual that all Gerson therapists uh, uh, are supposed to follow. Okay, And so, for example, uh, Gerson therapy is not vegan. That's one of the big controversies about it with a lot of people. They think, oh, that it should be, that all cancer treatments should be vegetarian or vegan, but just like in the eating documentary, uh, it's 95.5 because we haven't been able to prove scientifically that being vegan or exclusively vegetarian will lengthen the life of a cancer patient by one day. There's no proof. Now I'm open to it if somebody if, if somebody coughs up a long-term study and proves that the the death rate, mortality, and attrition, and longevity is better for vegans and vegetarians in cancer treatment, then I will be happy to take that into consideration. But as of right now, worldwide, there's no such evidence. However, a lot of evidence saying primarily plant-based, but certainly not vegan. And the most successful, ind named individual, locatable, like with a physical address. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people who say, that their program will cure you of your cancer and you cannot find their address or phone number. Now they'll use some conspiracy theory and like, well, I'm going to tell you the cure for cancer, but I'm not going to tell you where I live <laughs> or practice, you know, because the guys with guns will come after me and, and all that kind of stuff. And so under the, under the veil of secrecy, uh, and protection, you know, I'll give you the unapproved cancer treatment uh, and so on and so forth. But also, it's 100% not their problem if you have cancer. It's 100% not their problem if you try the remedy and it just kills you outright. 100%. Okay? Think about Gerson. They have an address. They have an office phone number. They have a website. You can go visit. They will do intakes for prospective patients with an appointment. You have to have an appointment. You can't just go and show up. They won't let you in the door. Okay, you make an appointment. You talk to someone on the phone first. And then they'll set an appointment for you. And you can come and you can bring someone with you. It doesn't have to be by yourself. And then if you're a medical person, they'll do that. And they'll take you in and they will let you spend however much time you want in their file room looking at actual patient records of terminal patients who come from all over the world with the most dire uh, diagnosis who were treated successfully and did not die and are still alive, most of them, and they do one thing more, which even Cancer Centers of America won't do. Not only will they give you access to the patient records, because the patients give permission. See, they ask every patient, they say, will you give us permission to show your success or show your, your, your case to medical professionals, which means give permission to set aside the HIPAA uh, uh, privacy protections under medical records. And most of the patients do because they're like, yeah, we want everybody to know. Okay? They do one thing more. They give the personal information and address and contact information for the patients. So the next step is after you look at their medical records, if you want to talk to them in person and you want to hear from the horse's mouth and get, their, get the skinny from them, directly what their experience was like and what, what their survival has been like post-cancer and so on and so forth. You can actually do that. Who does that? Nobody does that. I don't know of any, any other clinic that does that in the U.S. They're the only one. Right? So they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. They're willing to put their reputation out there. They're open for all comers. You want to be critical? Come on, bring it on. You say you're a scientist, a medical professional, an oncologist, and you think what we're doing is BS, bring it on. We'll show our patients, you show us your patients. Show us your success rate 
and your patient studies, and we'll show you ours. How about that? Fair enough? Quid pro quo? Just trial for trial, okay? They will do it. Now, back to Dr. Simoncini. I have a fair disclaimer, he's a friend of mine. He's become a friend. Um, I was with him for four days, I mentioned that earlier, last um, June, okay? Um, he's a hardcore MD scientist surgeon. He's no BS. His baking soda remedy is quite complex and quite scientific. You, it's not get your arm and hammer and put a teaspoon in a glass of water and drink it, and that's part of your cancer cure. That is absolutely not how it works. The way it works is, is he makes a very precise dilution of sodium bicarbonate and distilled water, which he then in, uh, in sulfates, which means you're on a live dialysis machine, okay, which is pulling your blood out of your body, running it through uh, a series of filters, temperature controllers, um, and as an adjunct, we're normally in, uh, let's say, kidney dialysis, there, the dialysis machine administers drugs at the same time as it filters your blood. Like it uses blood thinner so the blood doesn't coagulate while it's running through the machine and all this kind of thing. Okay, so instead of some of those drugs, this dilution of the sodium bicarbonate is going through the dialysis machine and is being administered in very, very precise dilutions at the same time as the blood. It's going through a dialysis machine. And also, you can look it up. Dialysis machines are not cheap. They're not. Most therapists can't even afford a good colonic machine. Uh, you're at, at 100 grand plus, you're not going to probably spring for a dialysis machine to do the sodium bicarb treatment. Okay? That's part one. There's another part. Well, first part is remove the tumor. He does surgery and removes the tumor. So this sodium bicarbonate treatment of the cancer is not without surgery. Surgery is the first thing that happens. Okay? The second thing is, um, uh, is the uh, dialysis. The third thing is that he uses a surgically implanted catheter, which is a tube, which goes in through your femoral vein, and is run up into the aorta and then directed to whatever part of the body where the actual physical, in situ it's called, where the cancer is located and it delivers a solution at a very precise rate of the sodium bicarbonate directly into the tumor site. And that's the best way because they do that over time with the catheter repeatedly. Over time you're getting treatments every day for 30 days or 60 days. It's done in a hospital, it's not done at home, it's not done ad hoc. It's, dialysis machines are not only expensive, but their, their maintenance is expensive. Because every part of the internal mechanism is one use per patient. Because you've got to replace every inch of tubing, every, bit, every filter, everything, every time it's used. They're very expensive to use them. Okay? Uh, and if you don't clean them and maintain them properly, well, you'll just kill your patient. So you don't want to do that. Um, the catheter has to be done in a primary care operating room. You can't do it outpatient, right? Because you've got to have live x-ray uh, on the operating table to follow the catheter as it goes through the veins. The third, the third stage is they do direct injection uh, with a hypodermic needle of solutions into cancer site. The fourth uh, treatment uh, adjunct is using uh, acupuncture needles as electrodes and using a 12-channel acuscope to surround the tumor with acupuncture needles and then use various uh, pulse waveforms of electricity to both to stimulate and to uh, sedate the cancerous tissue. Okay. Uh, and then there's a fifth stage which involves using iodine in various ways, okay? So, baking soda cure for cancer. Sounds simple. Mm, it's not so simple, okay? 
However, it works. And uh, Dr. Tulio uh, has now taught his protocol to over a hundred different treatment centers and hospitals around the world that are, that are using it today. So, for example, at the Jade Center for Integrated Medicine in Ibarra, Ecuador, okay, they do, uh, uh, Carlos, uh, the director there, uses Dr. Simoncini's protocol and they have uh, hospital privileges at, a local, at the local hospital there uh, where they can do the parts of the protocol that require hospitalization. And then at the Jade Center, they do all the nutritional consulting. They do the homeopathy. They do the bioelectric uh, medicine, the EDS, electrodermal screening, the pulse electromagnetic field therapy, the RIFE uh, frequencies, uh, far infrared. They have a 20-foot uh, tall, 20-foot square uh, pyramid uh, constructed where every square foot of the floor, all four ceiling uh, walls and even the door is lined with one inch of jade, okay, with a uh, mat, uh, a jade mat inside the pyramid, okay, and then they have another structure that's uh, uh, two inch thick floor to ceiling, wall to wall, Himalayan sea salt for ionic diffusion of uh, Himalayan sea salt and far infrared at the Jade Center, plus lifestyle, plus yoga, plus nutrition, plus indigenous medicine. They have the Quechua people come in and counsel patients with the local herbs that they are very familiar with. Uh, one of the Quechua ladies, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Maurizio, is a PhD in botany, but she's a Quechua Indian, okay, who lives in the, the village, <laughs> who lives in the village near the center, and uh, she also teaches at the university. She's about this high. Like when I, if I, you see a picture of me with her, if I'm hugging her, she's, she's down here. She literally, like if I stick my arm out like this, she doesn't, doesn't clear my arm. She's average height for her people, average height. They're only four foot, the Quechuas are really little people, but they wear 12 skirts and eight sweaters. And so they balloon out, they have, and plus their undergarments. So they have like, like all these uh, chemises and undergarments, and then they have like 10 layers or 12 layers of skirts, and then they wear like five or eight sweaters and a big bowler hat. And so they're, they're kind of like this, but they're only this, this tall with the hat, okay? But they're genius for, genius for herbal medicine. Genius, okay? I love them. I love the Quechua people. They are so sweet. Okay? But they are. They are they're actually the last in that area. They're the last surviving full blood Incas. What's well, left of the Inca. You know, you might think the Incas are extinct. No, they're not. Not by a long shot. Their survivors are called Quechua. Their survivors today uh, are called Sachila. Quechua and Sachila. Those are the Incas. The ones who built the longest road in the world before the wall was built in China. You know, that's them. Okay? Um, so, Tulio has taught his protocol to hundreds of centers around the world and he continues to do so and be very, very active. He's, he's one of the medical directors at our clinic in Nevis. And, um, uh, we're introducing his protocol to Cuba sometime later this year. We're hoping, tentatively, we're looking for around June. And I'll be presenting, so I'll be doing this class. Tulio will be presenting his thing, plus another 20, 25 docs doing their different alternative specialties uh, because the uh, Cuban government has now officially, under Fidel Castro Jr., has officially approved us to introduce an alternative medicine program for the Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Traditional, Ministry of Medicine in Cuba. Wow. wow. Okay. And so now it's just a matter of getting it, getting it going.
okay, which we're hoping to have a conference for this with the Cuban docs in uh, maybe sometime in June. Um, final, any last, just anything else uh, in your notes I from the really doc? Let, let me, let me yeah, just yeah. ask. Somebody, I had something about um, when uh, like you have cancer or something, they say it's like past down, you know, you have breast cancer. Who says that? Like if you go into a physical, have his physical the doctor. I didn't hear it in the movies or anything. Yeah. And they said, do your mom have cancer? Did your grandma have cancer? Did... Genetic inclinations for cancer. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. I'm, I'm going to yeah. say it like this. Uh, it's true and not true all at the same time. Okay. Uh, genetically, it is your, part of your DNA, it's part of your heritage that you have every predilection or inclination toward disease and or not that all of your predecessors have had as far back as back goes. However, what determines your predilection for the activation of the genes pro and con primarily is diet and lifestyle. Coupled with external factors as um, uh, what we call toxicities and deficiencies, malnutrition can be a trigger for recidivist uh, pathologic gene expression. That means starving of essential nutrients can create an opportunistic environment where many harmful things can manifest that are latent, that in ordinary circumstance, if you weren't severely malnourished, would never manifest, ever. And it's like one uh, doc I know says, I don't have a genetic predilection for cancer. There's not a genetic predilection for cancer in my family. There is a family nutritional profile that supports cancer in my family. And the reason why my family has a high incidence of cancer is not because of their genes, it's because my family eats crap <laughs> and always has, apparently. Okay? And so if you weren't malnourished and if you weren't toxic, you'd never have the cancer. And then there are other things. There are at least 13 different kinds of cancer. You know, every, there's, there's over 350 different kinds of cancer. Okay? But th for example, there's 13, and now uh, recently I read something that said there's may maybe 20 different kinds of cancer that the only time and the only place and the only way that they manifest in a person is if that person is chronically puffy. Edema, mm -hmm. inflammation. In other words, they only appear in chronically inflamed tissue. Only. If you don't have long-term chronic inflammation, puffy, you never get those cancers. If you're always puffy, inflamed, excess, um, when we do our... Uh, BIA, bioimpotence analysis, is part of our regular medical assessment, okay? One of the things that we measure is intracellular versus extracellular water, okay? Intracellular water, good. Extracellular water, bad, okay? Intracellular means water that's within the cells, doing what it's supposed to be doing, hydrating the cells, being the... Uh, uh, transport mechanism for nutrients and for electrical conductivity and so on and so forth. Extracellular water, low oxygen, ischemic, low nutrient, high in toxins, and the low oxygen, ischemic, high in toxin, extracellular water separates living cells from their oxygen and from their nutrient source starving them so they die. And that water is not a good medium for the transport mechanisms for immune factors 
things like T killer cells, white blood cells, for example. Not good for them. Okay? So you have chronic inflammation. There's at least 20 different kinds of cancer that you only get, that only occur. They're, they're, they're related directly to this. And guess what? Breast cancer is one of them. So you could say, oh, you have the BRCA gene. That's why you, you know, and they're telling girls as young as 12 years old now to have mastectomies because they're test positive for a BRCA gene. Okay? And maybe they can identify a relative somewhere who also had cancer. Alright, that's bull. I think it's criminal. I think the doctors who make those recommendations should be in jail, not in the medical center. Okay? Because the only reason they're making those recommendations is because they make a million dollars per patient. Long term. That you're a cash cow. Once you've been diagnosed with something like that, you are a profit center for the medical industry, and over your life, they expect to make a million dollars off of you. Okay? Because um, the gene expression is determined by toxicity, deficiency, environment, and nutrition. So even if you did identify BRCA gene, no problem. Just don't activate it. Don't be chronically inflamed and puffy and overweight. And what's a condition that, that is rampant, di uh, uh, epidemic in the United States that's contributing to the cancer factors? Diabetes. Diabetes. The biggest precursor right now in the world, by, and this is not, me, not, not Dr. J talking here, okay? According to the World Health Organization, and according to every international professional medical association of complementary and alternative medicine that treats cancer in the world today, the biggest precursor symptom that you're eligible for cancer is diabetes. And then we have what's called uh, uh, um, undiagnosed diabetes, which is just you're chronically inflamed, overweight, and obese, and just nobody has sat you down and uh, run your blood sugar. Okay? And about half of the people in the country who have diabetes don't know they have diabetes. But absolutely, I can tell you, I could go through Walmart, and without using a blood test or a blood sugar test at all, which is really easy to do, okay? But without that, I could walk through Walmart with a tape measure, and I could tell you the, the percentage of what every person in there is that they have diabetes with a tape measure. I don't even need to do a blood test. Don't need to test your blood sugar. All I need to know is how tall are you and what is your average girth. Uh, two numbers. That's it. Those two numbers. So all I need is a tape measure. And I can tell you with a 90 percentile, 90 percent, whether you either have diabetes right now or you're about to because I'm going to do your blood test next and then I'll tell you that you have diabetes because the only reason you don't know that you have diabetes is because nobody has done that yet. You haven't had an event yet severely enough that they ran your blood sugar. That's the only reason. So you have people who know they have diabetes. You have people who don't. More people don't know than do know. More people are chronically inflamed, edema, overweight, water retention, puffiness. You know, we use these terms. See, puffy doesn't sound like it's going to kill you. I'm just puffy. My people are puffy. I come from puffy people. <laughs> what a BS. What a load. You know, what a load. Okay? I forgive you, but that's it. Okay. Puffy is inflammation. Puffy is excess extracellular water. Puffy means your metabolism is upside down. Puffy means that you should be, an average person, according to Ayurveda, should be in uh, vata excess. 70% uh, of the population at any given time is vata excess. Okay. Except 
in the Western culture, which is uh, pitta. I'm sorry, kapha. Except in the Western culture, which is kapha excess. So you have all these vatas that are actually kapha excess, but mostly in the Western world. It is changing in the rest of the world because as they eat and live just like we do, they're starting to get develop the same physical profiles that we have. When I first went to Thailand, the average height of a Thai teenager at 14 years old was four foot eight inches. When I first went to Thailand, the average height of a 14 year old te Thai teenager was four, uh, uh, four foot eight inches, four foot nine inches. The average height of an average Thai teenager, a 14 year old today, is the same as an American, five foot eight. So just in my lifetime, the average height of the average Thai has grown by eight to 10 inches. When I meet my Thai friends' grandparents, all of them are four foot something. If you read traditional historical references to the Thai people, they were they were referred to as the little people. Strong, feisty, dynamic, the little. Same for Japanese. If you read descriptions of Japanese pre-Second World War, the nips were small. In other words, they referred to the tiny Jap cancer. Okay, I'm a cancer survivor. I'll go on record. I'll do that. I had three surgeries. I mentioned that before at Emory School of Oncology in Atlanta, Georgia. And I, ins I survived in spite of the chemotherapy, which was banned a couple of years after it was given to me because uh, it was considered a deadly poison and it killed tens of thousands of people during treatment worldwide. So that it was banned worldwide because it was far riskier to do the chemotherapy. More likely the chemo would kill you in a day or two than the cancer which wouldn't kill you for five or ten years. Right? And every time you hear of someone who goes into a hospital for cancer treatment on a Friday and who's dead on Monday, they did not die of cancer, even though that will always be the official cause of death. It's impossible. They died of cancer treatment. They didn't die of cancer. Cancer takes a long time. It's off you 5, 10, 15 years. So if you go into cancer therapy and you die in a day, a week, a month, six months, or even a year, cancer didn't kill you. The cancer treatment killed you. Um, the biggest thing that we can do for our clients to help them to not die from diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and so on and so forth, is to educate them to eat a sustainable, healthy diet. And, by the way, don't wait until you think you're an expert nutritionist or dietitian to start those conversations, because by the time you personally get to a place where you personally feel like you're an expert, probably a couple dozen people around you would have died for not having the basic information. Okay? And every client that you get, every single one, in the next 10 years, one out of three is going to have cancer. One out of three. Every single Take every single person you're going to see, every single person you're going to lay hands on in the next 10 years, one out of three of them are going to have cancer. Mm. So, personally, you should have the conversation about nutrition, about diet. Even if all in the world you knew was stop eating crap, I mean, you know, technical term, stop, uh, stop eliminate sodas, especially any kind of diet products of any kind, any kind of processed food, eat less or none, non-GMO if you can get it, local if you can get it, fresh if you can get it, everybody needs to learn how to cook. Because, you know, there are people who won't even make oatmeal because they don't believe they know how to boil water. That's ridiculous. Oatmeal is a cancer fighter. 
antioxidants, super cancer fighter, guys. especially if you do like I do and let it sit for a little bit so it starts to ferment. I know it sounds awful, but what happens is it changes. Enzymes begin to change the character of the proteins in the oatmeal and uh, it has a different quality. I discovered that in my research on it.